Who taught me about sleep apnea? Chuck Perkins. Chuck Perkins got me into sleep. I got into sleep like a maniac through my headache patients, surprisingly enough. So I'm going to just reiterate very quickly the stuff that he said. Why don't doctors know anything about sleep? Because we're all unconscious, that's why. Doctors are human beings. We're all unconscious while we're sleeping. We concentrate on what happens during the day. Unfortunately, we heal in sleep. All of us know we heal in sleep. The odd part is, my job, help people heal, I don't know anything about sleep. Very weird. So I happened by accident to fall into sleep. Chuck Perkins taught me most of what I know. And then, I'm going to go a little further. My thinking about sleep comes from a neurologist's brain, from a neurologist who thinks about headache all the time. I'm going to give you my view of what I think is making all of our sleep goofed up. And it crosses over most of the areas that he discussed. And you don't need a CPAP mask. That's the best part of all. OK. Because my answer to the Chuck Perkins is, all my patients said the same thing for the six years I was putting those masks on. Dr. Gomanak, it's not normal to wear a mask while you're sleeping at night. And I said, yes, you're right. If I had a pill, believe me, I'd be giving it to you. I don't. I hope I live to the point where we actually figure out why this is happening and fix it. And by weird coincidence, I think I figured it out. So one, it happened in my headache patients. They're not fat. They don't have fat necks. And although it's true that when you lay down and you go to sleep, the pharyngeal muscles get relaxed, it's not in all phases of sleep. We get paralyzed in only certain phases. So you can be sleeping on the couch watching a movie flat on your back, you're not snoring until you fall asleep. It's not just being asleep that causes the paralysis to go wrong. It's particular phases of sleep. Now as it gets really bad, they start to have apneic episodes all the time. But in general, we get paralyzed in certain phases of sleep. So here's now a neurologist's mind approaching this from the brain. Why would we get paralyzed in sleep? Why are we doing that? I'm going to give you my explanations of that. And then I'm going to take you where we went with vitamin D eventually. So when I see my patient come back and say, hey, I just wore this stupid CPAP mask for three weeks and my headache went away after I gave her all these medicines that I feel like I know the chemical background that makes the headache better. So my difference is I have this idea chemically what part of the brain are my medicines working in? What do they do? She comes back and this was early on before uh, Dr. Perkins just taught you that it's not really just oxygen. She comes back and she says, you know, my, my, my CPAP has made my headaches better. So I think man, maybe the brain is making some chemical like verapamil or Topamax. Wow, what a concept that would be. Now, she comes back and she also says, oh, my two teenage boys have sleep apnea too. Well, that's pretty weird. Now, the other interesting thing about my practice is I see kids too. I see people from age 5 to age 95. I see little kids who have headaches. They have sleep disorders too. That's kind of creepy. Why does everybody here, everybody in this room, 90% of you have a sleep disorder? That's creepy. That means it's a societal change that's happened probably in the last 30 to 50 years. It is not normal to have normal sleep. And I'm going to teach you about what I think normal sleep is, why it's abnormal now. Here's my grandbaby who gets to play a role in it. So I want to reiterate, these are my ideas. These are hypotheses. I'm going to give you a lot of ideas about how to think about it. Most of the journal articles have not come yet. That's going to come in the next 10 years. This reiterates what Dr. Perkins just told you. I think that we do light sleep because we're waiting for a safe place to get paralyzed. When you fall asleep right there, as I'm talking to you, you get paralyzed immediately, you fall out of the chair, you break your neck. Very bad thing. We actually get drowsy. We think drowsiness is just, oh, beginning of sleep. It's not. It's a specific state. It tells you that sleep is coming. Really important, because then it gives you a warning. And you can do things, slap yourself in the face, get up, walk around. There are people that you and I know that the cardiologists see, actually, for abrupt loss of consciousness. They just fell asleep without drowsiness. You can stretch out your sleep disorder to the point where your sleep switch is no longer normal at all. So some of the people who get sent to me for possible seizure, they're walking down the street and they fall asleep. We think because drowsiness isn't there before, 
oh, they had a loss of consciousness, must be a seizure. No. You can screw up the sleep phases so much that you can fall into deep sleep without drowsiness. When you think about it that way, and you think about each one of these as being, oh, very well-designed system so that we're warned, you can also think about it in this way. So I, I actually think about sleep more like as an engineer, let's say. Let's say we observe these things. Oh, we get paralyzed in sleep. Well, why do we get paralyzed in sleep? Well, I don't know, but if you were going to design a system so that everybody had to get paralyzed in sleep, all animals, not just humans, what would be the difficulties with that? That's one of the things we're going to talk about. So, light sleep, we're sleeping. That means you can sleep for 10 hours and not do any of the work. You can be in light sleep the entire time. That means you saying, oh, I slept fine, but I feel tired, real significant. It's not so much how much time you spent unconscious. It's what you feel like and how many pills you have to take in the morning that measures how good your sleep was. So, sl slow wave sleep that Dr. Perkins referred to, one of the most important things that happened to me after my patients started to come back and say, hey, you know what, not only is my headache patient but better, but my back pain's better, I started saying, well, you know, I saw this guy yesterday, I was doing this EMG on him, he has this terrible back pain, four surgeries, he wakes up every hour, he, stays, he wakes up every hour because his back hurts, I wonder if he has a sleep disorder. Sure enough, he has terrible sleep apnea. You put a CPAP mask on that guy, one month later, he wakes up with no pain. This guy's been five years with the pain experts. That means the ability of sleep to cure our body is a million times stronger than my medicines. Our lack of understanding of it is absurd. It is where we all heal our body. The CPAP mask, very important. It's not a drug. It teaches you all sorts of things because you're not given a drug, yet the patients get better. So, I go to this lecture. This woman comes at the end, Eve Van Kouten. She does endocrinology of sleep. At the very end of this three days at the Bellagio, which is why, of course, I went, and I was very happy to be there, and I was learning all this stuff. She says, you know, my lab just published the fact that growth hormone is released in slow-wave sleep in a pulsatile way in slow-wave sleep. And I think, wow, maybe that's why that guy with the back pain, all of a sudden his back pain's better. You know, maybe the growth hormone's acting like a repair hormone. It turns out our children grow in slow wave sleep while they're paralyzed. They don't grow while they're running across the basketball court. Think about everything that has to happen while they're growing. Both legs have to grow at the same rate. Both arms have to grow at the same rate. They have to have multiple guys there, muscle guys. The guys who are responsible for the arteries, for the tendons, for the nerves. They all have to be present together as a crew to elongate the limbs very specially controlled situation run by growth hormone while you're paralyzed in slow wave sleep. What if you think about that pulsatile release of growth hormone as being the same or an analogous thing happening in adults? Kind of gives you a way of explaining the healing process during slow wave sleep. And there are some specific articles about pain, body pain, being related to lack of slow wave sleep. So I picture that phase as being, and this is ve very oversimplified, okay? There are, there are articles that show we do repair in other phases, but just as a general idea of what we do during these paralysis phases. The next important phase has a lot to do with my daily headache sufferers, rapid eye movement sleep. We get the very most paralyzed at all in rapid eye movement sleep. Why would that be? We're all sleeping under a bush somewhere, you start to talk during your dream, the lions come and eat all of us. We were essentially small mammals lurking about with great big animals that could jump on us and eat us. That means while we're paralyzed and vulnerable, we have to be completely paralyzed so we don't give away our hiding place. If you start to sleepwalk and you're out in the normal environment, uh-oh, your kid just walked off a cliff. Your kid just got eaten by the lions. We don't see well at night. We are, by definition, up during the day. That means we want to hide away at night. You don't make noise. It's fatal to snore. It's fatal to talk during sleep. These are things that when we have now changed our environment so much that we can get up and go pee three times every night, nobody thinks that's weird anymore. If you had to get up and go to the bathroom and you were living out in the wild, you got eaten. It was not normal to get up and go to the bathroom several times at night. Our entire population now thinks it's normal. We have indoor plumbing, everybody has a bathroom right there. You ask, I spend my whole day asking people, well, how's your sleep? Well, I get up three times, go to the bathroom, it's fine, it's normal.
So it turns out when you don't get into these phases and stay there, just like Dr. Perkins just taught you, things start to go bad. All of my patients with daily headache have the same three complaints. I can't remember anything, I'm in a bad mood, and I have a daily headache. The daily headache doesn't have to be there. If you don't have the migraine gene, you won't have the daily headache. You don't get into REM sleep and stay there for the right period of time, you're going to be in a bad mood and you're not going to be able to remember things. So here's what happened to me. I've got all these young, healthy females, teenagers, at first, lots of them have sleep apnea, but it's mild. And then lots of them don't have sleep apnea. What do I do now? Dr. Perkins is the one that pointed out to me that most of my young, healthy females have REM-related apnea. So after about two years, I realized, wait a minute, they just told me there was no significant apnea on this gal. She's just as tired and cranky as the other ones. And he points out to me, well, you might like to know that even though she doesn't stop breathing a lot, she only gets into REM sleep for a half an hour from 4 a.m. to 4.30, and during that half an hour, she stops breathing eight times. So my other pulmonologists are sending reports saying, oh, eight times, eight hours, once an hour, not significant. Well, wait a minute, you missed the point there. If the rest of us do, you know, I don't know, two hours of REM sleep and she has a half an hour, it's that interrupted, that might be significant. We don't know why it's happening, but I'd still like to know it. Now then, what, what do I do? What do I do to treat that? I have sleep medicines. Great. I spent six years using CPAP, giving sleep medicines. None of the sleep medicines give back normal sleep. Not true completely. There is one drug that gives back REM sleep, the date rape drug. Like, I'm really going to give that to my 35-year-old with three kids. No, I don't think so. Now, I don't think that we should not use it. I just think, gee, how come I don't have a pill to make this better? How come nobody's writing about why this is happening? And now I'm doing sleep studies in all of my patients. Anybody who'll let me, I send them off for a sleep study. I got people coming back saying blah, blah, blah is gone. I don't even have third year. Woman comes back, my, well, how's that Lyrica treating your burning in your feet? She's had burning in her feet for five years. I'm her third neurologist. I'm not using it. Oh, well, your still feet are still going to be burning. No, they're not, they're not burning. Oh, what's your internist do? Nothing. You sent me for that stupid sleep study. I'm wearing that stupid mask thing. Two months into it, my burning is gone. I think, what? Your burning is gone? You, you know, you have that gene for diabetes and burning. Your ne nerves are dying. No, they're not dying. They're turning on inappropriately. And you know what? She put on the CPAP device and it went away. That is a fascinating thing. The doctors who have not gone through six years of watching what happens to the patient when you successfully improve their sleep have no idea what I'm babbling about with this vitamin D stuff. I don't care about vitamins one bit. I care about sleep. Sleep is the cure. Now the next part is, Let's try to figure out why it's going bad and what can we do about it. Because I do migraine all day long, I'm very focused on this area. This little stripe right here is what turns on inappropriately in migraine. Migraine has always been there. Human beings think it's normal to have a headache. That's pretty weird when you think about it. It's the only part of the body that we don't go to our doctor for. We go to the pharmacy, we pick up a medicine, we take it. We think that headache is normal. I know that a lot because I spend all my day saying, what about the littler headaches? It's the only part of the body that we think, oh, it's not weird for the pain system to switch on. That's strange. This little wire goes all the way down the spinal cord. Now, we have all these genes for migraine now. As Soon as they came out in the 1990s, I'm wondering, well, if these genes that make this thing switch on are in that stripe, how come the bottom half doesn't turn on? That doesn't make sense to me. Maybe the top half of the stripe is in a funny environment that puts it at a higher risk for switching on when no one hit you in the head. Headache is really switching on of a system that's only supposed to turn on when you bonk somebody in the head. It turns on spontaneously, okay? I'm focused on this area. I'm focused on the fact that this turns on all the time in normal humans. How come? So it turns out, once I get into this sleep stuff, that a lot of the things that control our sleep are right next to that little stripe. They're not in it, but they're right next to it. There are two, area, two things that happen in the little stripe in what's called the periaqueductal gray, this little stripe where the fluid drains out, the gray matter of the cord right, and the brain stem right around it. There are two things that happen there. One, we get paralyzed there. And when Chuck first told me that we got most paralyzed of all in REM sleep, I went back to the original anatomic books about where do, we, where do we get paralyzed from? How do they know that? These cat experiments, they put little wires in there and they buzz that part and they kill it. They tell you exactly where it is in the brainstem. Actually, it's in three parts. It's in one nucleus has three parts. Obviously, the diaphragm of the chest still needs to move while we're sleeping. 
This part, called the bulbar muscles, is also split out by itself. So everything else gets perfectly, completely yeah. paralyzed. This part, uh-oh, a little bit of a problem there. You get completely paralyzed there, you're going to not swallow and you're going to drown. So there's some special issues about this area. So when I started looking into the anatomy of that, the other thing I find over time is there are pacemaker cells in this area. This happens to come out of the Parkinson's disease literature. Dopamine, which is important in Parkinson's disease, happens to run the sleep. Most of the stuff that does timing and staging of sleep, not the complicated dreaming, all the things that happen in the endocrinology, just the clock that tells you what time it is and sends a message, okay, it's 10 o'clock, time to get that melatonin out there. The clock and the paralysis have to be intertwined tightly. You do not want to get paralyzed at any time except when you're sleeping. But these two things intertwine right next to that headache stripe and why would my patients who are young healthy women have two different sleep disorders? So Perkins went through all these different, the, these different things that we see. Unexplained awakening to light sleep. Leg kicking. We don't know why. Why is it periodic? Why do they stop breathing a little bit? Why is it that my patients that stop breathing a little bit have a little bit of leg kicking? I completely agree with Dr. Perkins that it's not the oxygen. It's the sleep interruption that makes the patient sick. How could I model this switch so they only have one problem? In biology, instead of a consistent thing, so we have to stay paralyzed. What we do in biology is not a, a stream of electrons buzzing through the wall. What we do in biology is we have neurons that send pulses of neurotransmitters. We, th we perceive it as a constant state, but it's always at a certain rate. So it turns out that I began to think of this. What if we model it, and I, this, I make up these things because I want to teach my patient this, so they won't think I'm a total <laughs> nut, okay? So I'm, I'm saying, what if we paralyze, what if we talk about the paralysis, which is a, a speedometer needle, and it has to be cruise control 65 miles an hour, and it starts to wobble a little bit. What will you see? It'll wobble a little bit towards too paralyzed. Uh-oh, where do you lose? Well, the legs are already paralyzed. You won't lose there. You lose here. Too paralyzed. What's going to happen? Uh-oh. You breathe in. This collapses. It turns out that the brain already has a little switch that's watching for that air movement. He showed you that on the thing. It's not that the technician comes in and wakes that person up to light sleep. No. Your brain is already designed. As soon as the air passage stops, it wakes you right up to light sleep, it's already designed with that engineering difficulty in mind. You swing to two paralyzed for one brief moment. You wake up to light sleep immediately. What if you swing towards not paralyzed enough? Talking, chewing, jaw pain, leg movements. I learned, as, as Dr. Perkins has learned, that we have these goofy leg movement medicines. We don't know what they're doing, but the patient comes back and says, you know, my CPAP device, I'm wearing it every night, my headache's better, my mood's better, my memory's better, but my knees still hurt. I look back, oh, you're moving your legs a lot. I'm going to give you this blah, blah, blah medicine, make your legs stop moving. The knee pain goes away. They wake up in the morning with no knee pain. That's pretty amazing. That's when I started to make up this idea that, oh, you have to be paralyzed. All the moving parts of your body have to be perfectly paralyzed in these phases of sleep to get the repair. And it turns out that most of the pain that we wake up with is from the waist down. Back, hips, knees, different for each person. You got an old football injury? It'll be that knee that'll hurt you first. Okay, let's just say then that we have this paralysis switch it's swinging back and forth. We see both of those things. Then all of a sudden, everything kind of falls into place for me. I'm looking at one after another of these sleep studies. What if we try to get it in sort of an overall idea of what's really happening here? Every single one of these people have a problem with either the timing of sleep or the paralysis of sleep. They either can't go into a phase, can't stay in a phase, or their paralysis is not correct. Apnea or leg movements. So, as I send more and more and more people, I start to have more and more diseases that get better. All of a sudden my Parkinson patient comes back and they're not trembling anymore and I haven't added a medicine. That is very impressive to me. That means I could actually cure people by getting their sleep better. And again, I'm thinking, why is everybody in my practice got a sleep disorder? 
And my patients say things like, I know you guys made it up. We want, you know, you're making money on these CPAP devices. I know it's just to make money. Well, it turns out if I were going to make money on the CPAP devices, I would have actually gone into a different career. And from my point of view, they were a pain. I hear, you know, an hour and a half every night after I finish seeing my patients talking about their stupid CPAP device. I completely understand what Dr. Perkins is talking about. It's terrible. Now, that guy who said, are you sure it's going to help me? I guarantee you, if you said to him, all you have to do is go to Walmart and buy this pill and take this, he's going to be really happy about that. Plus, all these other things get better too. There are several things that make, when we stumble into this vitamin D thing, make it make sense. One, it's a societal change. Children, young adults, adults, older people in developed countries, the percentage of sleep disorders, if you just take not just CPAP needing adults, but everybody who doesn't sleep well and doesn't feel rested and has to take pills for something because of all the things that Dr. Perkins described to you, that's a lot of people. It's much more common in developed countries. I have a house in Mexico. I actually go to places where there is no electricity. They still live in sticks. Only one guy in the whole town is fat. Who? The policeman. He's got a little block house and he's got a window unit. It's the only electricity that comes to the whole town. He's the fat guy. He's got hypertension. Everybody else lives outdoors. Sleep apnea is not an epidemic in Thailand where they're still plowing behind some pack animal. And I'd already seen that and wondered about it and was thinking more along the lines of what toxin comes from internal combustion engines that could be doing this to us because it's everybody. So then here's what happens to me. Here's all the stuff that's associated with sleep apnea. He did a great job in leading up to this. He did a great job with this. Obesity comes from the same thing that causes sleep apnea. It's not that you get sleep apnea because you're fat. He did all the stuff, I don't need to do it. Ghrelin, leptin, orexin, all are related to the same thing that causes the sleep apnea. And those of us who don't have sleep apnea still get big fat butts. Who gets a big fat butt? The women after they have babies. And I'm going to explain to you why that is. <laughs> okay, CPAP is a disaster, okay? I hated it. I did it. I was a big convert. I would do the same thing that Dr. Perkins described. I would sit at, <laughs> poor husband, would sit at the social and, and things and tell these people about why they needed CPAP. I mean, he, he, would, he would just get so embarrassed. But it works. Now, here's the next thing that happens. I'm thinking now, not only is there something interesting going on in the background, but how come everybody in my practice has a sleep disorder? It's not just the headache patients. It's this elderly person. It's this youngster. Why is it everybody? And all of a sudden I have this shift in the way I look at things. In medicine we're taught five people come in with the five symptoms the same. They all have the same disease. All of a sudden I'm thinking, well this person has one thing and this person has another thing, but if they have a sleep disorder I can fix that. I can be a hero with no pills. That would be great. So I'm starting to look at it differently. And then I have this 72-year-old guy who comes in. He's got daily headache. Well, I happen to be practicing at a time when I have a CT of his head already. He has normal anatomy. That guy has a migraine gene. His sisters had migraine when they were young. His mom had migraine. He never did. Why is his headache coming on at 72 instead of 15? Hmm. Look for his sleep. His sleep has become abnormal in the last 10 years. What that implies is he has to have the migraine gene in order to switch on that little head pain area. But we've all, we all have these genetic diseases. For instance, every epilepsy patient who has a genetic epilepsy, when you do testing for that gene in three generations, what you'll find is eight people have the gene. Four people have had seizures. Two of them had a single seizure. Two of them are on epilepsy medicine. They all have the gene. Why? Why is it different? This is what the doctors say. We see that. We see that. Okay, that's great. What can we do about it? Nothing. It turns out that when the sleep goes bad, we stop repairing our genetic weaknesses. What does that mean to me? One, if you don't have the migraine gene, you'll never come to see me for headache. You'll come to see me for something else. My practice is such that I don't see people who got shot with a shotgun. What I have in my practice are people who are living their life, they eat well, they, we have the most wealthy, best informed population ever to exist on the planet. They're just living their life and all of a sudden their nervous system starts to go bad. Some of them have little twitches, some of them have seizures, some of them have burning in the feet, some of them have headaches. 
something has happened to them while they're leading their normal life. That means most of the diseases I see are of a genetic basis. But they've had those genes since day one. Why are they, why are they showing up now? Why do, what, was one family member get diabetes at 82 and another one at 42? Look at the sleep. You fix the sleep, the brain has been repairing that genetic weakness since the day you were born. It finds a way to shore up that weakness. Once you see it that way, all of a sudden, the idea that you could correct the sleep has amazing possibilities. Okay, so here's what we do next. What's going on here? Why is this malfunctioning? How come nobody's teaching me what to do about this? Why don't I have any pills for it? And here's what happens. July of 09, I'm sitting there with one of my poor patients, 18 years old, daily headache sufferer. She went to her sleep study. She comes back. She's sitting with me. My sleep study evidence is she has 35 unexplained awakenings an hour. She never stops breathing. She doesn't kick her legs. And she's already asleep. She's very tired. She comes back, and I'm looking at this sleep study going, this is a disaster. She has terrible sleep, and I have nothing to do for her. A CPAP mask makes no sense. I have a bunch of sleep medicine. She's already asleep. What should I do for her? By accident, I say, well, because I don't really know what else to do, did your doctor do all those fatigue labs? She's really tired. I've already given her verapamil for a daily headache. It's a little bit better. I'm really tired. We do her B12. Her B12 is 175, really low. This is an 18 year old. Why would she have a B12 that's low? Number one, I've never done a B12 on a headache patient in my life. I go to Google, B12 deficiency symptoms, fatigue, daily headache is second. Now at this point, I'm about to shoot myself because I consider myself a headache patient uh, expert. I've never done a B12. It's not in the neurology literature. Now that's a little upsetting. You know, I read all these books, I read this neurology literature. It's supposed to tell me the truth. Right? No, she has terrible B12 deficiency. Now, for the first time, because I'm thinking about those pacemakers all the time, what they've taught us in Parkinson's disease is the pacemakers that use dopamine, if you cross-section the brainstem and you look at all the little nuclei that use dopamine, the pacemaker cells fail first. The theory is that the pacemaker cells, because they keep beating the day that that's formed, they never rest, they never stop, they beat all day, all night, they have a higher metabolic demand. So the theory behind Parkinson's disease is it's a toxic exposure that those pacemaker cells are not able to repair. So for the moment I think, wow, B12 deficiency. What if her brainstem needs that stuff and the pacemaker cells fail first, every single cell in the body is B12 deficient, but those pacemaker cells need it more. And you know what? Those 72 year olds who come in to see me with daily headache, they all have pacemakers here. Maybe the pacemakers here and here are failing at the same time. So like a maniac, I start pulling blood on everybody who comes in, right? I'm doing B12s on everybody. By accident, one month later, one of my patients says to me, my doctor did my vitamin D level, it was low, she gave me vitamin D, my wrist pain went away. And I think, ah, I don't care about that. I don't care about vitamins anyway, you know? And if she hadn't said my wrist pain went away, I wouldn't have even cared at all. But she happens to have a lot of things wrong with her. And I still have a whole body of patients who are on the CPAP mask and still have back pain, still have leg pain, still are having daily headache. So I, unfortunately, get left with the ones that don't succeed, all the things I'm trying. So I think, well, I'm drawing blood anyway. Throw the vitamin D in there. So for four months, between August and December, I draw bloods on everybody and I do B12 and a vitamin D level. By November, now I'm really happy because I don't have to do the sleep, the, Chuck's sad, but I'm happy because I'm not sending off sleep studies every day. And then I don't have to call them up and tell them about their sleep studies every night. But instead, I'm spending an hour and a half filling out these lab slips every night. And every night I'm writing, your vitamin D is low, take a thousand international use of vitamin D. And then I'm, some of them are B12's low and some of them are odd. And by November, I think, you know, my husband is still nagging me. I don't get home until 9 o'clock. I'm going to Xerox this lab slip that says your vitamin D is low. Take a thousand international units of vitamin D because I write it 15 times a night. And then I think, wow, this is weird. Why is everybody's vitamin D low? I mean, these are young, healthy people. I know two things about vitamin D. You come from, it comes from the sun and it's about the bones. That's as much as I know. But I think, wow, this is weird. If we make it from the sun, it's August to December. Shouldn't be the highest of all? This is strange. Everybody's below 30. I don't even know what the normal range should be except what's written on the lap slip. But I think that's weird. But I never really think about it any more than that. So in December, two of my patients come in. They've been wearing CPAP for a whole year. The first guy says to me, I've been wearing this stupid mask for a whole year. I am asleep. I wear it all night. My wife will tell you that I got it on when I wake up in the morning, but my headache is still there. But the good part is, the last time I was in here, you sent me that little note about the vitamin D. I started taking the vitamin D. And in about 
three or four weeks, I noticed I was waking up more rested and my headache went away. And I haven't had a headache for six weeks. And I go, wow. Now that is interesting because the B12 was there about one in every 20. Really sick ones. The ones that are on the mask and are on 15 medicines, they're just miserable at age 35. They have B12 deficiency. But every single person with a bad sleep study has a low vitamin D. Also, around the time I was thinking about this is weird, I think, well, I guess, you know, I didn't use sunscreen when I was growing up. Mm. So it's about, I guess, you know, 78. Well, about the time I went to medical school, we start sunscreen. Mm, air conditioning becomes commonly available, computer, television, and we tell everybody to go inside. So, oh, I guess the vitamin D, vitamin D epidemic might actually, wow, this guy says his sleep is better. Could vitamin D have anything to do with sleep? So what I spent my Christmas last year doing is I go into the computer and I say, has anybody written about vitamin D in sleep? Well, the answer is no, except where it did lead me to was, where are the vitamin D receptors in the brain? Now, why would they be in the brain in the first place? I think that's weird, but let's read that. It turns out that there are vitamin D receptors in the brain, in that little stripe that I've been pointing to for the last six years, looking like an idiot with my little model saying, something is badly wrong here. Now, if I only had this and I had no explanation of why it was there, I would not be here today talking to you. However, here's what really happens. It's not a vitamin, and the guy I'm going to introduce you to, named Walter Stumpf, actually explained what this chemical is for in every animal on the planet in 1982. He put together everything I'm going to tell you. The only thing he didn't tell was the sleep because he didn't know it. But the sleep fits into this much bigger picture that makes a lot of sense. So, it turns out we make vitamin D from cholesterol on our skin. As soon as you say that, my first you know, thought is, oh, huh. Does that mean when my vitamin D is low, my cholesterol goes up? Good question. Nobody knows the answer to that. But we certainly do have an epidemic of high cholesterol over the last 40 years that we told everyone to go, in, go inside. Two, Hmm. Every animal on the planet makes this exact same chemical. Birds, furry animals, fish, reptiles, insects, the exact chemical we make on our skin. We all make it from the sun. Why would we make it from the sun? What would it have to do with sleep? This guy, Walter Stumpf, is a brilliant scientist. He started into steroid research. He wanted to know where the steroid hormones affected the cell. Very difficult stuff because steroid hormones go into the cell, they sit on the nucleus, and they make, they go into the nucleus, and they make the DNA express certain proteins. They actually affect what our cells do, what proteins they make. Because it's inside the cell, very difficult to show where they are. And you have to have a perfectly normal hormone, make it go into the cell, hit its receptor, and go in and do its action. Here are just some of the beginnings of his articles, starting in 1979. He starts to write articles by organ system, showing you where the vitamin D receptors are. Now, because he comes into it through the steroid hormones, not through the vitamins, he isn't polluted by the idea that this is a vitamin. He knows about steroid hormones better than anyone. He knows like every layperson knows. If it's a hormone, what's the level? If it's a hormone, it's a, got a hundred effects all over my whole body. He goes into it with that and he begins to realize that he actually comes up with an idea about why it's there and why it's there on every animal. He also wants to know why would we have a steroid hormone that would be made from UVB light. Why not infrared? Why not ultraviolet? Why not visible light? Turns out that UVB is this narrow wavelength that because of the tilt of the planet is the only wavelength that's there in summer and not in winter. This is a hormone that has existed since we climbed out of the water and wandered away from the equator. Because every single one of us animals in this room had to deal with, we don't now, but we did have to deal with, six months of summer and six months of winter. Now we have completely divorced what the vitamin D level is from the food that we have. But up until the last 500 years, there was no food in the winter. 
everything Dr. Perkins told you about the metabolism, what we did in the winter was we didn't eat. And when we didn't eat and you can find a way to not eat very much and put on fat, you're going to survive until the next spring. So it turns out that these are the GI tract. What you do with your calories, how you eat, how much you can dissolve is all very much related to whether or not you'll survive through the winter. Can you eat enough and dissolve enough that you can build your body in the summer so that you can actually plant, till, and harvest 80 acres? You find a way to do that and you'll survive. You'll be one of the ones that made babies that were your grandparents. So here's the high D message and here's the right level for high D. You can eat 10,000 calories in a day. How do we know this? Because Texas actually has rural forebears. You actually have people that you know in your life that ate a huge pile of food for lunch and laid down for a nap afterwards like it was no big deal. None of us in this room can do that now. My husband's grandfather was out picking cotton with him when he was seven and his grandfather was 72 in 100 degree weather for six weeks. Nobody can do that anymore. My patients are so weak, they get heart failure at 35. This chemical has applications not to just a bone, it builds every single tissue in our body. There are vitamin D receptors in the anterior horn cell that builds the muscle, vitamin D receptors in the ovaries, in the testicles, in the fallopian tubes. It has allowed us to be linked, our reproductive system is linked to the sun. If you get horny, in September, and everybody mates at the fertility rites that happen at the end of the summer, that baby will be born in June. Vitamin D is not a vitamin. It's not in the food anywhere. That's why the government put it in the food. If it had been in the food, they wouldn't have had to supplement it. It's a hormone. We make it. It's only available from the sun. That means your baby's born in June. That baby will grow, be strong, and get through the first year of life. The baby born in December has six months before any D becomes available. That means you have eight kids. The ones born in June are the ones that survive. This has been there forever and ever and ever. The doctors don't know about it, and I'm going to explain why. That's really important. Thyroid follows it. You bring the, your metabolism from basal hibernating in winter to incredibly strong, incredibly energetic, and sleeping for six hours in the summer. The sleep bit is the only part that Walter Stump didn't write. So I actually call this guy up and say, Dr. Stump, I need to talk to you about this. Has anybody written about sleep and vitamin D? And he says, no, but it makes perfect sense because you want to sleep less in the summer because you're working and doing things. You want to sleep more in the winter. In fact, as soon as you go back into the literature of what happened before electricity, we all slept for 14 hours. When there was no light, you went to bed early. They're in there from 4 p.m. until 6 a.m. You hope that they're going to sleep because they're driving you nuts, but also you have no food for them. They get one little piece of dried meat a week. That means if they sleep, they stay all covered up, they conserve their energy. The children who can eat one little dry piece of meat a week and put on fat, that means you can go out in the spring, in February, and make it until the food becomes available in April. That message has been intertwined in our biology forever. We're just like bears. They put on strength in the beginning of the spring as they eat more as the D goes down they put on more fat they climb in a hole and they hibernate unfortunately we have been living in the last 30 years in constant winter as far as our body is concerned not only do we feel grumpy and as though it's been a long winter when did the antidepressants become epidemic same time frame late 70s early 80s so Let's talk about why none of us know about this. From my point of view, what this implies is this may be the reason why we have an epidemic of sleep disorders, not just sleep apnea. And I love the fact that Dr. Perkins prepared you for the idea it's not oxygen. Sleep disruption. And there are many different ways that sleep's abnormal, but my concept is that it's happening really in one place that has always ma managed the timing of the sleep, how long you stay to sleep, how you knew, and there's all this interaction between when the sun goes down and when the brain stem starts to tell you to go to sleep. The pineal gland that he was referring to has this light perception, so there's this very complicated system that tells you exactly, oh, what season is it and when should I start to go to bed? People do sleep differently at the equator. They stay up longer and they don't change and change their sleep cycle when they live at the equator. They stay about the same cycle. We, as we go up north, we sleep longer in the winter. 
As soon as air conditioning becomes available in all the developed world, we're not stupid. It's 100 degrees outside, we go inside. We sit in the air conditioning. We make an air conditioner for our tractor. So even people who have an outdoor life, they don't go out there and stand around when it's 110 degrees in August and say, hey, wow, this is great. So why did this happen? Unfortunately, there was one little mistake that happened. Vitamin. Vitamin in the 1980s became a code word for, oh, that stuff, nutrition for lesser humans, dietitians, female, somewhat sub, you know, below us doctors, male doctors in the 70s. So we don't pay any attention to vitamins anymore. Nutrition is now delegated. It's not sexy anymore. There's really one guy who does D in this whole country. One guy, Michael Hollick. He writes the only textbook. In this, this year's edition, he says it's a nutrient. This guy can't get his head around Walter Stump's articles. He doesn't think the same way. He doesn't like what Walter says, so he doesn't let him publish his articles. Dr. Stump has several articles published in the 80s about peer review and his feelings about that. Most of his articles are published in European journals. And it turns out that most of the really good stuff about D is breaking through into the regular journals. I'm going to show you a bunch of them. But most of the good stuff happens in Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Canada, High North. They know their societies are failing because of this. And they don't have to go through the peer review of Michael Hollick. Because if he doesn't think the way I think, I don't get my article published. These are all the things that are listed, already published, in peer-reviewed journals as being epidemiologically related to vitamin D deficiency. Same list that Chuck Perkins showed you for sleep apnea and sleep disorders. Here's all the stuff that's related to the GI tract. Everything, every person I see is on four medicines. By February, after I came back in January, I thought, this is the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me in medicine. I cannot believe that everybody who walks in here has this one thing. I think, I've thought it was normal to be on four medicines by the time you're 40. A little some for reflux, a little some for maybe a little hypertension, an antidepressant, some for sleep, you know, those are the things that normal people take. We are now in a society for the last 30 years that it's normal to take four pills by the time you're 30. Our teenagers take a lot of pills. Why is that? This. This vitamin D, if we make it from cholesterol, there's a cholesterol connection there somewhere. There's a lot of debate in the literature of how directly this is related, but it's related in some way. When the statin lowers the cholesterol on my skin, oh, does it? Yes, it turns out that when you lower the cholesterol in your body, the raw material to make vitamin D goes down too. That means even if you do go out in the sun, you probably don't make the same amount of vitamin D as you did before couple of connections to statins. We also have the active enzyme that makes what we call the active vitamin D. So the active vitamin D that does its work, that goes into the cell, is called 125-OH. Every place you have that enzyme that takes 25 to 125, we assume that's where it's active. We have that on our skin. That means these elderly people whose skin is all trashed, if they're on a statin, perhaps that statin is keeping them from making this chemical that's there to protect your skin. Now there's lots of basic science articles. Take a skin cancer cell, grow it in a petri dish, put vitamin D in there, it acts like a normal cell. The D goes into the nucleus and makes that cell stop reproducing inappropriately. It turns out that many inflammatory connections, all of the bone marrow components have vitamin D receptors. White blood cells in particular. There's a whole body of literature of all the autoimmune disorders are linked to vitamin D deficiency. But interestingly, from the cardiology point of view, uh-oh, knee replacement, shoulder replacement, hip replacement. Why do all these patients that you guys take care of in the hospital who have heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, also have knee replacement, rotator cuff surgery? It's not by coincidence. They come from a similar origin. Not only is the knee still moving during sleep, but the white blood cells are completely insane now. They're in there chewing away at the joint lining instead of replacing and repairing it. Most important part about that is all these vitamin D receptors that are all over these other organs, our body is still organized to work totally differently in the eight hours while we're sleeping. We are organized to use our body while we're awake and repair it during sleep. That means everything switches over. 
What I'm going to try to teach you is the reason why we haven't gotten the next part, which is let's make the disease better with the D, is you have to get the sleep better before the D effects become obvious. So the sleep part is really important. All of these have articles behind them that show that they're epidemiologically related to vitamin D deficiency. Here's why it got called a vitamin by mistake. In the 1930s, the kids come in, their legs hurt, the doctors have a new toy, the x-ray machine. Everybody's getting x-rays. They're x-raying their feet, they're x-raying their legs, they're x-raying everything because they have this new toy. The kids come in with leg pain, I think, because they're kicking at night, because I see kids who come in to see me with leg pain and they're kicking at night. They don't have osteoporosis. They're kicking at night and their legs hurt when they wake up. These kids come in, their bones are abnormal everywhere, but their legs are what hurt. So the doctors get fixated on the bones and they stick with the bones. Now, right at this time, the doctors are still in possession of an idea, vitamins are the way we will make a normal, healthy human population. We were still interested in vitamins at this time. The doctors start making an animal model for rickets. They take rats, they narrow their diet until they have funny bones. Then they start adding back things from their diet till their bones grow normally again. Oops, the rats are nocturnal animals. They don't go out in the sun. Now I just told you every animal on the planet uses this. What does that imply? If you were able to find a way to make your vitamin D receptor such that you could find a chemical that was kind of like vitamin D in fungus on wheat, all of a sudden you've got the entire night to creep around and eat people's stuff and they're all sleeping. That is a really cool niche. That'll mean you get to reproduce, you get to do things, no one's there to kill you, you don't have any natural predators. You can go in those ships, it's completely dark down there and you can survive just fine. Why do we like rat and rats and mice as scientific animals? Because you can put them in a cage and keep them in a house their whole life. They don't need UVB light. You can give them food that has UV-like stuff. It actually grows on fungus. It's D2. What's weird about this? We doctors are still giving out D2. D2 is not what any of us make. D2 is what rats use. We got it in our head that because we found it in the food, oh, it's a vitamin. But the weird part is, even though they named it a vitamin, and they named it vitamin D because C had just been described, the first two chemicals they found on this fungus were one and two, and then they couldn't find it on humans. And they gave chickens this stuff, this D2, and they didn't like it very much. Their bones didn't do very well. Then they find D3 on pig skin, and from then on, they're doing all this D3, but they still get it in their head. It's a vitamin. Vitamin means my cell needs this chemical. I can't make it, therefore I have to get it from my environment. This is not that. This is a hormone. We make it. It's not in the environment anywhere, except for cod liver. When they found this stuff, the only place they could find it on the whole planet was cod liver. That's why everybody in the 40s and 50s and 60s got cod liver oil. Now the weirdest part of all of this is they still say it's a vitamin, but it's not in the food. And we make it ourselves. What? They still can't get their head around the fact this is a hormone. If you tell lay people this is a hormone, what are the two things you think? Has effects all over my whole body. I need to know what my level is. This is pivotal to why the scientific studies, they've shown that they're all related. The next part is, how do I make the patients better? The dose is now the key. Why is this important in cardiology? One article after another, all the things that Dr. Perkins just showed you about sleep deprivation, exactly the same articles. Vitamin D deficiency causes blah, blah, blah. Metabolic syndrome. Atheros and all these are these are prominent, well-respected medical journals now. Diabetes, atherosclerosis, sclerosis, animal family medicine. All of these are now the big-time journals. But only in the last five years have these started to creep through. Every single aspect of artery health. Why do we get abdominal aortic aneurysms in people who also have heart disease? Why do we have blown arteries in the groin with somebody who just developed a big hole in their heart? 
These things are all related to one another through the fibroblasts. The fibroblasts have vitamin D receptors. So it's not by accident that we have people with peripheral vascular disease and diabetes and hypertension. Number one, they don't sleep, so they don't repair their body. But number two, vitamin D has a lot to do with the health of multiple areas of the body. So all over the place, and this is particularly interesting. Back in 1991, I forgot the authors, but this is a Dr. Stump article that shows that the atrial natriuretic peptide that's made in the atrium of the heart has vitamin D receptors on it. Fascinating that my patients with vitamin D deficiency, their leg swelling goes away. And what's even creepier, you get the vitamin D up too high, over 100, the swelling comes back just as bad. So like every other hormone, go too low, get screwed up, go too high, get screwed up also. And I'm a little worried that there are some of my patients out there that I got them a little too high and they had an event of heart failure. I haven't had anybody that I proved that in yet, but this is directly related to vitamin D. You'll also find that the BNP that we measure, that's related to this as well. BNP is another similar to the atrial nitroretic factor. My personal feeling is that we've made these statins over the last 30 years in response to the fact that there's been high cholesterol because there's been a vitamin D deficiency. If you go back to the population and the timing of the things that we started, all you have to do really is watch television. As you watch television for three hours, every single drug you see advertised related to plugging a hole that is developed because of this. So epidemiology, that's great. What the doctors want to see is, okay, how do you cure my patients? They're both there. A and B are both there. Does A cause B? Here's the problem. You have to understand the concept that this is not a vitamin, it is a hormone. Many of the articles that I'm reading, they don't understand that yet. One of my journal articles in neurology, the first time a vitamin D article hit the neurology, June took patients to 30,000, 40,000 international units a day. I was really excited about it because I was given 20,000. I thought, great. They take the patients all the way to 40,000 a day, no toxicity. Turns out they're wrong about that toxicity. It is absolutely there and I'm going to teach you what happens, but they don't understand the basic concept. It's not the dose, it's the level, okay? So the cure is the sleep. That's why this particular presentation is so important. I don't care about vitamins. I care about what Chuck Perkins taught me. Sleep is what cures all of us. Then the next question was, what can I do to fix all these people whose sleep is all screwed up and I dump into this stuff? Sleep is still the answer. You get excited about D, you go too high, the sleep gets screwed up on the top end. So I spent most of August being in a cranky mood with lots of back pain, feeling like my balance was off and my legs were giving way, like all my patients tell me. And it turns out my vitamin D level was too high. It was only 95, but it was too high. Off of that for six weeks, I'm feeling chipper, what, running in the morning again, feeling good. So it turns out that the thing I want you to take from this is it's the sleep that cures the patient. Every single hospital in this country is set up for the doctor's convenience. We wake up our patients to do an x-ray at 3 a.m. We draw their blood at 4 a.m. We bathe them at 5 a.m. That is ridiculous. These people are at the lowest ebb of their physical strength and what do we do? We come in and we interrupt their sleep. We poke them with pins. We in in introduce infectious agents and we can't understand why they don't get better. This is very odd and now it, the next phase of medicine is going to be, oh, when the patient comes in the hospital, let's protect their sleep. All the night nurses are very interested in this vitamin D material. <laughs> okay, and here's the dosing part. I went to FDA recommended dosing when I wrote what the people were supposed to do because I don't care about vitamins. So every night I'm writing these little notes saying, take a thousand international units of vitamin D. That's what the FDA says. So I come back in January. I've read all the stuff I told you about. I only knew a little bit of it at that time. And I come back all excited. I think, oh, we're going to cure the headaches. I'll be able to go home in a normal hour. My husband will stop yelling at me. I come back. <laughs> Nobody's better. And these women that I'm seeing the first two weeks, they're not wearing CPAP because they didn't have sleep apnea. They just can't sleep. And they're all cranky. They want a divorce and they have daily headache. And I said, well, wait a minute, are you taking that vitamin D? Yeah. I think, well, this is weird. You know, how come those two guys with the CPAP got better and these didn't? So then I measure their vitamin Ds again. They're all 10 points lower. Most of them are 25 to 28. Some of them are really low, but they're all 10 points lower. 
And at this point, I freak out and think, oh my goodness, my friend Marissa is pregnant. She just went through 10 years with five miscarriages trying to get pregnant. She's never been able to sleep. This is what's wrong with her, and she's on a prenatal vitamin with 400 international units in it. Half what these women are taking. They're not even pregnant. Their levels just fell by 10 points in four months of winter. Just by complete accident, I happened to time this perfectly. Because if I'd done it in the summer, it wouldn't have come out this way. They would have gone up. So it turns out nobody got better. So I say, well, golly, we've never really had a symptom to follow with vitamin D before. I give you some vitamin D and I say, hey, how your bones doing? I don't know. They're okay, I, I guess, you know. With this one little idea that these two guys come back and say, hey, could the sleep be related to this? I say, okay, take 2,000. Ooh, that sounds like a lot to me. Take 2,000, call me back in a week and tell me how your sleep is. And I start to take 2,000 because I'm pretty cranky in February. And I think, you know, I've thought about having a divorce in February. I wonder what my D level is, you know? <laughs> I'm not even taking any vitamin D and my level was 35. I bet it's like 25 or less. And now that I think about it, I get up five times a night, you know? I cough, I get up in the middle of the night. I think my sleep is normal. So I start to take 2,000, and it turns out nothing really happens. The sleep doesn't get better. Nobody's level goes up. So then, in February, I'm in Mexico lying on the beach, and I get into the internet, and I find this place called the Vitamin D Council. Vitamin D Council is a bunch of doctors who've been doing this much longer than I. They've been trying to encourage the FDA to increase the recommended dose to 10,000 a day. Now, I happen to think that would be extraordinarily wrong, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But they say 10,000 a day is what you need to stay the same. Well, I've got patients in there who've had daily headache for 20 years, and they do not want to stay the same. So if 10,000 a day is enough to stay the same, what do we need to give to get them to a higher level? And then the next question is, what's the right level to have normal sleep? If it says 30 to 100, does that mean, I don't know, 32 is as, as normal as 82? So I'm wandering around, not knowing at all what to do. So I say, well, what's the most we can make on our skin? We all make 20,000 on our skin, middle of the day, middle of the summer. Depending on the skin type you have, you make it slower or faster. Turns out that your skin color has a lot to do with how fast you make this. That means if you pick someone up from the equator, remember that little graph where he showed you that people who had normal weight but were from oriental or black or Mexican extraction, they had a higher incidence of sleep disorders. You pick up somebody who is actually genetically made to be at the equator and you move them someplace like here where it's so hot in the summer that we all go indoors. It turns out it takes them eight hours to make the same amount of D that I might make in a half an hour. That's kind of a scary thought. So I start giving 20,000. Now, I would, not exp I would not recommend that anyone in this room take 20,000, okay? You have to be extremely respectful of this chemical. It's very powerful, but I was given 20,000, and most people have no side effects, but you have to be very careful for how long you do that and why you're doing it, okay? So you get back 20,000, you get to 60 and 80, and it turns out it's not 30 to 100. My level only went to 95. I was miserable for six weeks. You go above 80, things start to go bad. So that published level, 30 to 100, not right. For perfect sleep, it's 60 to 80. So the right dose, if you want to give it yourself or give it to your patients, you start with whatever you're comfortable with, and then you get your D level done two months later. And you see what happened. And keep in mind, it's different in the winter than in the summer, and it depends on how much sun you've had, okay? There's also two concepts here. One is, how do I get from a level of 15, which is what all the patients you take care of in the hospital, that's where their levels are running, except for 3 West B, where they got hit by a car, okay? That person did not come in the hospital because they have a low vitamin D. I've actually had one patient I've seen in the last six months who got shot with a shotgun. That person did not have a vitamin D deficiency. But all the people who get sick and wind up in your hospital beds, this is one of the things that's in the background that leads to that. So if you're going to get to normal sleep, that's what's going to change the disease. Unfortunately, it may take another five years before somebody really gets a handle on this because my idea, there's one article that was just written this year. A guy in Shreveport just wrote that one of his African-American patients changed her sleep disorder with vitamin D. That's the first article to hit the PubMed. This is going to take a while before people get a handle on that. What that's going to mean is all the doctors who, by the way, are not in this room, what you'll notice is a lot of caregivers, but very few doctors here, okay? Just like me, 
Uh oh, they think they know everything, all right? So they don't come in and they don't hear this. That means they get the idea, oh, Dr. Gomanak's crazy about vitamin D. No. I was crazy about sleep way before that. All my patients got sleep studies. They all got CPAP. This is the thing that makes them better, and they're happier about this than they are the CPAP, I'll tell you. It's the sleep that cures the disease, and if you go too high, the sleep disorder comes right back. I started waking up with this weird jaw pain. I wake up in the middle of the night, and my jaws and all this weird stuff. I would never have noticed that, except I spend every day telling my patients, if you hurt somewhere in the morning, it's because you're not getting perfectly paralyzed at night. That means that these effects are almost invisible to the patient and to the doctor. Unless you're a sleep expert, you're not looking there. You will not know the difference. Okay. The FDA recommendations have to do with a population. Here's the big weird part. It should never have gone to the FDA. This is not a vitamin. This is a hormone. It's a hormone that runs all of our other hormones. What that means is the FDA has just been asked to give a recommendation for a daily dose to hundreds of people who are different skin color, live anywhere from Florida to Alaska, have different habits of going outside. There's no way they can get a single dose that will do that. And not only that, in my view, this stuff is, the word toxicity is absolutely applicable. The thing that isn't there in the books is the list of symptoms that come with the toxicity. You'll never see that. What you'll see is hypercalcemia, and then they'll quote that. The hypercalcemia doesn't come until you've been on this for years and you've been toxic for years. I guarantee you, though, you will feel awful when your level's too high. Everybody has a different set of symptoms because when you destroy the sleep, everybody has a different set of symptoms. Some of them have neurologic symptoms, some of them have diabetes, some of them have pain. When I came into this through sleep, it didn't seem the least bit weird to me that everybody has a different set of complaints, but they all have vitamin D deficiency. You get the vitamin D right, the sleep gets better, and then all the neurologic stuff gets better because the neurologic stuff comes from the sleep disorder, not from the D. There's not D everywhere in the brain. The only neurologic thing is MS. MS is a vitamin D deficiency disorder. All that area of the lateral ventricles where I showed you where the where the vitamin D receptors are, that plays a huge role in MS. So MS is one of the vitamin D deficiency disorders, but all the other neurologic effects that we see are all from sleep disruption and not having normally restorative sleep. What this means is most of the doctors that are setting up the clinical trials to treat the illness are still looking at the FDA recommended doses. They shouldn't be. The FDA has done exactly what they should have. Three weeks ago they were asked to give a new recommendation for the daily dosing. They said 800 international units a day. That was really smart. Because if my government had been putting 10,000 a day into my milk and it made me feel the way I felt in August, which is usually my month to feel great, I felt terrible, I would want to kill somebody in my government. That is not an appropriate place for this to be. And the fact that it's over the counter means that I can't depend on different suppliers to have the same amount of vitamin D in there. This is one of the most important chemicals that we have at our fingertips to cure people and we can't depend that the pills have the same amount that they say on the, on the label because they're over the counter. It's not FDA approved, doesn't have to have any of the requirements that the FDA requires. This is a big, big mistake. Okay, the other thing is vitamin D has multiple different layers of complexity. Once you start to read into this literature, you'll find that the top half of the D has different responsibilities. All the seasonal stuff I told you about, that's the top half. The bottom half is how our body hangs together. That means if you don't know what you're doing with this D2 stuff, it should never be there. D2 is not the same. It made all of my patients sleep worse. Now, not all. 99% of the patients don't like this D2. The patients that had low, low levels, like the November, December, when I didn't really know what I was doing, I gave them D2. Because, oh, their level's 8. And I went, oh, ooh, this is terrible, you know? Everybody else is 30. So I gave them these 50,000 international units D2 pills. Assuming that it's because it's a prescription, it must be safe. They all come back in January, February, say, that stuff screwed me up beyond belief. I couldn't sleep, and my headaches were terrible. And of course, my response was, you have daily headache and you can't sleep anyway. What do you know? You know, I didn't believe them. And it wasn't until, I'm like every other doctor, yeah, you're crazy. And so the sixth patient who tells me this, I think, man, that's the sixth patient who's told me this. Maybe I should read about this. And then I discover all this D2 stuff, and I think, why are we giving that? You know, that's crazy. What if this acts as a partial antagonist, bumps off the D3, and now they can't sleep at all? That's insane. I actually, one of my patients who ended up at BHC, 
because she became psychotic. She took the D, no, luckily it wasn't my prescription, but she took the D2 every day. She was already very cranky and weird, but then she took the D2, she was, she was very difficult, but she took the D2 every day, she got psychotic, and she wound up, because she couldn't sleep for two weeks in a row, she wound up in BHC. There's a big connection between most psychiatric illnesses and this as well. One other really important thing for the cardiologists in the room, many of your patients, D2 is, D3 is not your only concern. Many of your patients that have AFib, elderly patients who have Parkinson-like disorders, this hits their dopamine. Dopamine runs all this stuff. Once the dopamine gets affected, their sleep goes downhill. All the Parkinson's patients, even before they ever develop Parkinson's disease, have terrible sleep disorders. That means you really have to get in there and supply a little dopamine. So if the patient's got a level between 60 and 80 for months on end and they still don't feel better, send them to me and we'll work with this. By the way, I see nothing wrong with CPAP. I'm not against CPAP. All my patients who have CPAP devices, they like them, they keep them. If and when they feel like it's bugging them and they want to take it off, I don't berate them anymore. But if they feel better, they keep it on. My concept is that CPAP device is there as a crutch until their brain sleeps long enough in normal health that they repair their sleep apnea. Because it doesn't stay there forever. I have two patients in which it was reversed from terrible sleep apnea to none. I don't have any sleep studies to show for it now because unfortunately all my people with CPAP, I screwed them up by going up too high on the vitamin D. So now we're on the downside and we're trying to get them better again. So I thought by now I'd have several sleep studies to show that when you get the vitamin D where it needs to be. But it turns out there's a tight little narrow band and you have to be in that band to get the sleep better and you have to stay in that band for the patient to get better. All right, um, one other thing for those of you who want to take this, multivitamins are really important because there are a few little cofactors that the vitamin D needs. B12 is frequently there. It's there about one in every 20 patients. The vitamin B12 that I stumbled into this first, the gal who had the B12 at 178, she came back with a B12 shot, she was no better. They all told me the same thing. I give my shot, I have good, two good nights of sleep, and then I feel terrible after that. And it turns out we gave it once a month because Medicare paid for it once a month. It is not stored. It is in water, like every other waterable soluble vitamin. There are 10 years of research out of, out of Europe that show that B12 pills actually are absorbed just fine when you get the dose up high enough. And what it comes down to is the D drops the acid. We all feel like there's too much acid because the esophageal sphincter is weak. It's all up here. Therefore, we all take reflux medicines. Now we have no acid. The B12 is the only B that comes from meat. So now all the women who've just had three kids, why are they hypothyroid, B12 deficient, iron deficient, and can't sleep? because they just sucked up the vitamin D with their three babies. And those prenatal vitamins only have 400 international units in them, and they never get repleted. That's why they're overweight, cranky, can't sleep, have back pain, and are not laying by the pool in their bathing suit anymore. The second wife looks like that, not the one who bore your kids. Because she didn't get everything ruined by having the three kids, okay? One other thing, if you get leg cramps or more headaches, you need more magnesium, okay? This does sound a little flaky, but Dr. Fanus, I'm standing in the elevator, everyone greets me with the same greeting, you know, I'm taking my vitamin D, and he says, I'm taking my vitamin D, but I have to tell you, if I don't take my pumpkin seeds, I get headaches. So if you get a little bit of headache or a little bit of leg cramp, you need a little extra magnesium, and since I don't really want to understand magnesium, because I feel like I'm already weird enough with this vitamin D, I just say, give him the sunflower seeds, that's easy. Okay, here are my basic concepts. One of the things that Dr. Perkins did for me we blame our patients. I signed on to the internet about a month ago and said, what do they say about I can't fall asleep at night? All the teenagers that see me for headaches, they can't fall asleep at night. What do they say? You do it wrong. It's your fault. You stay up too late. Everything in medicine used to be, you'd go to the priest, 20, 200 years ago, go to the priest. Father, I have blah, blah, blah. Oh, give me some money, go pray, you'll get better. It's your fault, you sinned, go pray. Now, you come into me, you say, I have blah, blah, blah. I say, okay, good. Give me some money, it's your fault. You don't exercise enough, you're too fat, your back hurts because you're fat, your feet hurt because you're fat, you don't eat right and you don't sleep right. It's your fault. And I'll tell you, once I got into this D stuff and my patients, you get them to the right D level, they just stop their sleep medicine. And it's working beautifully, except for the Parkinson's patient, it works beautifully. It's not your fault. It's medicine's fault. When I got into this, I thought, who is it that's telling the FDA not to give us enough? Is it the drug companies? And for a while, like two or three weeks, I was thinking, boy, there must be some, some conspiracy. And then I thought, you know what? Those guys, they just want to make money. They, don't, they aren't going to make pills for diseases that don't exist. 
These, things, these, these diseases exist because medicine screwed this up. You aren't going to make pills for reflux, depression, erectile dysfunction, sleep, high cholesterol, and the all, you know, arrhythmia, on and on and on, unless the disease exists. That means it's my fault. This is my fault. I didn't see this. It didn't get into the literature that I was reading. I feel the same way as the other doctors. I don't care about vitamins. I don't care about nutrition one bit. I want to be able to do whatever I want to do. Drink wine, eat a lot, and not be fat. I, that's what I'd like to do. So it turns out I think that medicine is responsible for this. It's a weird political mistake that still exists in the literature. This, as there's a really good quote that Dr. Langston has in the afternoon that talks about how truth is always perceived as horrifyingly wrong by medicine to start with and then becomes accepted later on. I want you guys to have the opportunity. This is over the counter. Be careful with it. It's powerful and it will screw you up if you don't pay attention. Medicare will let you do this four times a year as will all of your insurance. You need to know your level. You can make little assumptions about it, but every single person as they wake up in the morning needs something that they can identify that's not just, how's my sleep? Because if you're successful with this, your sleep will be great. You'll sleep for eight hours, you'll wake up fine. Before it gets really terrible, you have to have something that comes back. For me, it was leg pain, back pain. For the next person, it's headache. For the next person, it's vertigo. For the next person, it's something else. You have to follow your le level. You have to be really careful with this. And this has the potential to change the face of medicine, as far as I'm concerned, through the sleep. The sleep is still the most important part. If you stay up all night, even though your vitamin D level is fine, because you're partying, you're still going to feel crummy tomorrow. Okay, I tell my patients, you get your level back where it is, you have a kitten jumping on your head all night, like my husband and I have right now, it's not going to matter whether your D level is okay, it's the sleep that's the cure. What do you do? You measure the 25 OH, not the 125. If anybody you know is on D2, get them off of that stuff. Give them my handouts. I have a website. The website is not selling anything. The website is there because I run an hour late every day because I try to explain this to my patients. It is a lot to get your brain around. It's very complicated and it takes a lot of steps. From my point of view, it's not logical at all. And uh, as soon as somebody comes in and I, you know, I say, hey, I'm going to give these vitamins for your headaches. I don't want them to walk out of there and go, vitamin wacko. You know, I want them to figure out why I'm thinking that, that it's their sleep that's going to make them better. Get your patients into 60 and 80 range. Keep them there. Whatever you feel comfortable giving or taking yourself, just start with that, okay? Don't take 20,000. If you're, if you're well enough to be in this room, you probably don't need 20,000, okay? If you're in the hospital, you might need 20,000. to give you a little kickstart so you can sleep to get better. And here's my grandbaby again. <laughs> and thank you very much for listening.